Check. All right, good morning. It's not often that I get to say good morning for a lecture concert event, but uh, I want to welcome everyone to ASUBB on my favorite holiday, Halloween. And we're glad to have you all here, and uh, got, a, got a great lecture for you today. I heard this, uh, when was the last time you did this? Seven, eight years ago? Yeah, something like that. So uh, we're excited to hear it again because, you know, I'm can't say I, rem I remembered everything, so I'm excited to hear it again. Uh, but we want to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Lecture Concert S Series uh, and Committee. I am Britt Bristow. I'm the head of the Music Department here and co-chair of the Lecture Concert Committee. Uh, and we are very excited to have this event today. We do have a few more events coming up. We have a theater production later on this week. We have a band and choir concert later on in the semester and another lecture coming up on the 15th of November. So uh, check our calendar for those dates, and we'd love for you to all come back and participate in those things, and we'd love to have you here. But in the meantime, we're going to get to the business at hand. First of all, I need everyone to take out your cell phones, and please put it in the silent position. We don't want to have any extra scares of your phone going off in the middle of all of this and making everyone jump uncomfortably, so please be sure your phone is on silent. And uh, we ask that you uh, give our presenter your undivided attention today. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn everything over to my colleague. Please welcome Tiku Gumala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bristow, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to tell you that uh, I had to have my, my drink with me. There are student tears. Exactly like Dracula, I feed on uh, student emotion. But because I see people from the administration in the room, I want to be on the record saying these are tears for happiness. Okay, so that being said, ladies and gents, um, let me tell you a few things about Dracula. My approach to Dracula is going to be rather different, so I hope I'm not going to disappoint you. I know that I already disappointed you that I don't have that cap and the fangs, but to be on the record, I want to tell you that black and red was his colors. I mean, the real Dracula. So that I just dress in right? red and black. As you'll see in his image, he's normally using the red and the black. So he was a real leader. I'm just going to tell you a few things. So first of all, my approach, it's a rather scientific one regarding the myth versus the reality. Um, now, for example, uh, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you, but for example, if Dracula will come to me and tell me that he is all-powerful during the night, I, because, right, the sun will make him disappear, I will tell him that the moon has no light of its own, it just reflects the sunlight. So, as you can see, science can save lives. Now, of course, there's the other one, right, about Dracula and Miss Dracula. I don't care what the marriage counselor said. The mirror has done nothing to improve our love life. Anyway, it's a, I will bring this uh, sarcasm here. I hope you will survive the day. Um, probably um, Count D, the, the mythological Count D, will find my blood rather sarcastic. There's a certain amount over there. So, honestly, I'll try to make a parallel between history, right, and uh, myth, right, the story. And on the other, I, I want to tell you that I will um, try to see what is behind this myth, where this undead thing appear, how they appeared, and I will propose a hypothesis at the end. You'll see. So, um, of course, Trying to give uh, people the truth, it's always a little perilous, if you know what I mean. Once uh, I read uh, uh, a short essay by a young lady who said uh, Socrates was a Greek philosopher who walked among people telling them the truth. They poisoned him. So it could be a little bit of uh, a danger for me in that direction. 
Now, let's start with location, location, location. So, to be on the record, yes, the real Vlad Dracula was a Romanian prince. He was Vlad the uh, Third, uh, and I'll tell you a few things. He was born in the region of Transylvania. So, yes, Transylvania is a real region. It's not a made-up Middle Earth kind of a thing, a real region. He was born in the city of Sigishwara, and this yellow building is his birthplace. We've been over there a couple of times, but right now it's a restaurant, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's somewhere around here. You see, the mountains are exactly like that, like this L shape, back L shape, okay? And um, Transylvania, the word Transylvania means the land across the forest. Transylvania. Maybe you know or you don't. William Penn wanted to call his, uh, uh, his colony Transylvania. Why? Because Transylvania was famous for the tolerance among Christians at that time. Only after his death, they called him Pennsylvania. So here is the connection. Also, the Ottoman Empire, you'll hear me a couple of times mentioning the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, it's what is right now Turkey, even though that is not the same. I'm gonna be honest with you, they were a kind of a not very nice force at that time. They literally spread all the Balkans all the way to Vienna. So the Ottoman is not a sofa which you buy in Walmart. It was a real uh, empire, pretty big in that area. And the Romanian territories were actually literally like a sandwich at uh, the south here. Because by the way, Dracula was not ruling in Transylvania. He was ruling in this south part called Wallachia. However, Bram Stoker, the Irishman who wrote in 1897 the book, he kind of had a very fuzzy idea about the history and the, the geography, and he put Dracula's castle here. You see? Incorrect. Again, these are the mountains, right? The real Dracula's castle is here. And uh, again, to bring some news, uh, seem to be that, I'm not so sure if it's true or not, Elon Musk is right now in Romania having a Halloween party, so yeah, it's about uh, in, in the Dracula's castle, which you'll see it in a few seconds. The price from what I heard rumors is about a million dollars, right? Okay, so, and by the way, Angelina, Jolie, and a couple of other big shots, they are over there. So, anyway, um, let's move on. First of all, if there are three things to remember, I mean, not to remember, but interesting things about the Romanian history, there are three. One, it would be the diversity. Indeed, uh, these three in, uh, regions, I'm gonna go back for a second, these three regions, each of them, they had an influence. Moldavia was influenced by the Russian, which is here in this part. Wallachia, by the, the, from the south came the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, and Transylvania, Hungarians, and the Austrian Empire, the Habsburg Empire. So I remember that I, I have, um, by the way, I, I do this one in my summer vacations. Before the pandemic, I'm going to these cruise ships and some crazy people, they pay me for <laughs> to come and see me. And um, indeed, I have a conference about Romania, I call it three men in a boat, because it's it, pretty much like that. The influence are clear in each part. If you go to the east, the south, and to Transylvania. Now, um, that is the diversity. So it was a very diverse, um, uh, um, I mean, due to these um, influences from all these three empires. Another thing, it is the language. I know that sounds a little funny, but believe it or not, the language is Romance language, Latin language. I have, of course, a joke for that, as usual. From the Latin language comes the Italian, and then the kids, but there is always an Adams in every family. <laughs> the Romanian language is influenced by the neighbor. All the neighbors, they are not Latins. You see, I mean, all the others, they are surrounded by other Latin countries, Romance speaking. Romanians are surrounded by Slavic. So that's why you have about 75% of the words are Latin based, 25% are Slavic. The third part interesting about the Romanian history would be the fact that 
for reasons which are, again, debate, the Turks, Ottoman Empire, never ever transformed them in colonies. So there were no Turkish colonies in these uh, regions. They just have their autonomy, which means they pay an yearly tribute, but they never been transformed. Like, for example, all the other neighbors, if you're looking again back, back to this, here it's Serbia, in the south is Bulgaria, and even Hungary, they were all transformed in Turkish colonies. For whatever reason, the Romanian. Now, we claim that the, they sing a braveness, but I think it was the madness of this Vlad Dracula, which kind of convinced the Turks that that's probably, there are some guys which I'm gonna let them alone. So, anyway, that is one of the, right, suggestions. Now, let's go and discuss a little bit about how, by the way, any of you read the book? The book, yes, it's okay, few good, because I will have some connections with the book. The book was published in 1897, it's right, pure Victorian uh, period, by Bram Stoker, who was an Irishman who worked on a theater uh, uh, in, in London. And um, it's actually called um, a, classic, um, a classic invasion book the invasion book, like H.G. Um, um, Wells or Conan Doyle, it is that they were afraid of invasion. Foreigners will come and they are strange and they will attack them. The Victorian um, approach is the fact that for the Victorians, the world of Dracula is an anathema. It's full of unrestrained violence, passion, and sex. Because, I don't know if you know or not, the famous Dracula's kiss, it's of course an allegory for, for sex. So, of course, for the Victorians, it was probably the worst thing possible, right? Again, these crazy foreigners which will come and, uh, right, destroy us. Um, now, how is the West dealing with that land, strange land, right? Uh, from the Balkans, a wild east. Well, the, the approach is, I mean, not the fact that Dracula has to be killed. He has to be defeated, completely erased. And if you remember the end, the United West, an Englishman, a Dutchman, and an American, they are united to destroy Dracula. Now, Interesting enough, and I'm sorry how, you know, with, with the image, but this is an image from the movie, 1992. It's the, the end of Dracula. Uh, the, the movie, Bram Stoker uh, movie, uh, Ford Coppola. Uh, at the end, Dracula is somehow um, grateful to the foreigners because he wants to be brought into the light. So it's a kind of a psychological connection that um, a subconscious final, a fictional uh, expression to force peace in a dark area. Kind of a, what they thought at the end of First World War, that the Balkans will come into the light. Yeah, yeah, good luck with that. We know now that is not true. Uh, anyway, so he is somehow grateful to the foreigners. Thank you for giving me peace. Funny enough, um, a century later, the American literature took over with a similar, but if you allow me to say a more parochial approach, with Nikolai of Carpathia, who is actually a copy of Dracula. He is dark, charismatic, intelligent, ready to corrupt the poor American souls. I'm like, I, I felt the same when I teach physics. Anyway, so. Let's talk about, again, so actually, remember that I told you that Bram Stoker was uh, working in a theater and all the mannerism of Dracula are based on this character, Harry Irving, who was a really very famous Victorian actor. All the language, the uh, everything, what you see in the movies is based on this character. We don't know for a fact, I mean, clearly Dracula didn't do his homework in historical things. The geography, as I told you, was a little uh, fuzzy. But anyway, originally he called the book 
Count Vampire, but then eventually he changed it and the character is Vlad III, as it's called by the Romanians, Vlad Cepes or Vlad the Impaler. The name Dracula, as you see, is a connection with, and I'm very grateful that uh, HBO now it has uh, the famous House of uh, the Dragon because it's exactly like that. It's coming from the dragon, as we will see. In Latin, the name dragon means Draco. In Romanian, the devil is Dracu. So Dracula, it means the son of the devil. That's what it means. So why, you will see in a second, it's coming actually from his father and his grandfather. Now, who, okay, what are other possible characters behind Dracula's character? One is this lady, uh, pretty nasty figure, 17th century Hungarian countess, Elizabeth of Bathory. According with their records, she killed somewhere between 50 and 700 maids, young maids, to really bath in her blood, in, in their blood. And some rumors said it also drink the blood. Why? To preserve her youth. She was around 40 at that time. So anyway, dangerous. Uh, anyway, so the idea seemed to be that, and you remember the connection from the, again, coming to the book, every time when Dracula is feeding, he appear what? Younger. So that's the connection with uh, Elizabeth of Bathory. Now, eventually, as I said, seemed to be that um, after he seen this lithography, uh, 15th century, that is Vlad Dracula as Pontus of Pilate, judging Jesus, it's a German lithography, then um, um, Bram Stoker went and chose uh, Vlad the Impaler as being the main character for, for Dracula. However, he gave him the wrong nationality and the wrong location of the, of, the, of the castle. Another interesting connection, it is coming with the language. Remember that um, uh, Bram Stoker was Irish. The name Droch, to say, I'm, I'm trying to say correctly, Droch Ola. Droch Ola means bad blood in Irish. So it seemed to me that young Bram Stoker heard a lot of stories uh, for a lot of um, uh, stories from her, uh, from uh, his mom. His mom survived the cholera epidemic of 1832 in Ireland. And she saw, and she was telling to young, impressionable uh, uh, Bram Stoker, uh, stories that people, they were still alive and they were pushed with poles into graves, still alive. So for him, that was an impression and somehow he connected in, um, in the, the book. Now, after that, pretty much a star is born. So uh, originally, the book was not a great success, but what made it success? It was the coming in just a few years of the cinema. And um, believe it or not, only Sherlock Holmes has more books than, than, than Dracula. There are, uh, um, 200 movies about Dracula and 1,000 novels. Again, um, it's a perfect Hollywood story. It's about evil guys far away, right? And um, there are, of course, cartoons, comics, ballets, um, of course, musical, and so on and so on. Most famous uh, adaptations, 1922, Murnau, um, it's uh, uh, the um, uh, Nosferatu, Bela Lugosi in the 30s. In the 70s, it was uh, Christopher Lee, 1972. But I'm telling you, probably the only one which is connecting the history with the myth is this one. Uh, it's uh, um, Ford Coppola, 1992, Bram Stoker's Dracula. So yes, this is for the first time when they made the connection between history and they connect exactly, right, the part which you will see that, yes, they are true about the real character and, of course, with the Count Dracula thing. Now, of course, my favorite is uh, this one. <laughs> Dracula dead and loving it. I, I've got even a clip at the end if you guys want to see it. Uh, there is also a historical approach. There are uh, movies like The Dark Prince in 2000 
is the hero approach. Uh, he is presented as a hero. As you'll see, the stories about Dracula, they are kind of uh, in two directions. You will have um, from the West a certain uh, uh, part in his stories which are you know, very scary. From the East, he is more of a kind of a Robin Hood, if you want, which is taking, uh, right, it's, it's just against the, the thieves and the, 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 land, the, 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 the nobles, a.k.a. the boyars, and of course against the Turks. Now, um, in 1976, the Romanian government of that time, uh, communist at the time, he, I'm just going to be honest with you, my youth, I couldn't read the book in Romanian. I had the book by a friend brought to me, kind of a illegal, the book was forbidden in Romania until 1989. So I read it in the 80s and I was shocked because, again, we never heard about these kind of things. For the Romanian nationalistic communist regime, it was he's a hero, and all of these are nonsense and stupid, and they are just trying to. Anyway, so um, eventually it was the, I mean, after 1990, we actually got the book for the first time translated. Now, let me tell you about the House of the Dragon, because where is the name it's coming from? In, um, there are a couple of stories about this. So, first of all, this uh, gentleman from here, Sigismund of Bathory, was the king of Hungary and eventually the emperor of the R Holy Roman Empire. And he found this Order of the Dragon in 1408. That is the symbol, the Order of the Dragon. Technically, it represents the, again, the dragon represents represent the Turks, Ottomans, right, which are, is killed by St. George. That's the connection. So that's why a lot of the people who fought at that time against the Turks, and there was the Serbian uh, prince, Stefan, then the father of Dracula, Vlad, Vlad Dracu, received this order. It was the order of the dragon. For the Romanians, dragon equal Dracu, which is devil, right? And the son of Vlad Dracu was Dracula son of the devil. That's where it's coming from. Now, uh, originally, the, the, the grandfather, it's another very famous uh, character of the Romanian history, Mircea the eldest, he fought uh, against the Ottomans of um, the, uh, a crusade, and because of that, he received what, I repeat, no other uh, countries in the region, he received autonomy. That was completely strange for that time. And by the way, if you, you can check and see exactly that it was caught for a couple of centuries. Now, to, be, to keep that one, it was really very difficult. And that came to his son and then to his grandson, Vlad Dracula. Um, now, the House of the Dragon, again, so actually, here comes, if you know a little bit of the history of uh, England uh, with the famous War of the Roses, Lancaster and Yorkshire, exactly like that, almost exactly like that. From this old gentleman, they came two sons, Dan, which were uh, one, and the other one, Vlad Dracula, which is the second one. So, actually, they were exactly like two parts of the family, and I'm not joking, when I was looking at the Game of Thrones, it looks like they take copies from the European history because they are exactly like that. Brother against brother, cousin against cousin, and it was a blood feud for over 150 years, killing one each other. As a matter of fact, probably Dracula hated, outside of the Turks, mostly the guys from the other family. Pretty much like Richard III, right, and very similar a character. So that's why I'm saying, he was not really dramatically different of any other European leaders. However, you have to multiply his victims by a thousand, <laughs> as you'll see. So anyway, I repeat, from the Latin Draco comes Dracu, devil, and the son of Dracu, Dracula, that's his name. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the history uh, in this area. So, uh, this is the region where he lived, uh, he ruled, I'm sorry. He was born somewhere around here in Transylvania, but he ruled here. Now, this area, Wallachia, at that time it was a, literally like a sandwich between two big empires, which 
it happened to be the bad luck, they reach their heights of power at that time, both of them. The uh, uh, Hungarians in the west and the Ottomans in the south. So that was exactly like a sandwich. That's why for this very small country, it was, they literally changed al uh, uh, alliance with either the Hungarians or with the Turks. Now, the difficult part was that actually uh, in 1442, when the Turks attacked Transylvania, uh, originally Vlad Dracu, which was the father of Dracula, he tried to stay away. But the, the Sultan said, no, you, you choose either the Ottomans or the other ones, the, right? The Hungarians were Catholics. So in order to, in order to keep him in place, he asked him to send two of his sons to the Turkish court in Edirne, uh, was not Istanbul at that time, and both Vlad Dracula, he was a teenager at that time, and his young brother Radu the Handsome, they are sent to the Turkish Sultan court. Here comes trouble. Why? Because allegedly, allegedly, his young brother was sexually assaulted by uh, Mohammed II, which was eventually became the conqueror of Istanbul at Constantinople. That's when his hate against the Turks came to some incredible levels. That's when his signature, the impolation, right, came, and that is, according with some sources, connected with that incident. He spoke perfectly the Turkish language. Remember that Dracula spoke the language of the beast? Okay, you see the connection? The language of the beast, so he spoke perfectly Turkish language. He could have, he dressed his uh, soldiers in Turkish uniforms and attacked them, as you'll see. Now, uh, in 1447, the Hungarians, um, they, they bring the other family, the Danesht, the other family, the family which Dracula hate, okay? And they attack here and they arrested, and it was uh, this guy, by the way, he was also of Romanian descent, uh, uh, John Huniadi, and he attacked, and actually the Romanian nobles of that time, they took his uh, father and his uh, eldest brother, and they buried them alive. So that is, was the moment when the Turks released young Dracula, and they sent him to Wallachia to be their man. That was a big mistake, as you'll see. So actually, he arrived uh, around uh, 1452. They release him, young Vlad Dracula, to, clone the throne of, to claim the throne of his father. Equally hating the Turks, the Hungarians, and above all, the Romanian nobles, uh, boyars, as they were called, especially those which were against, he considered them the source of all evil because that's why this, uh, they were like literally in one year, they were like three or four princes, only for a couple of months. So actually Dracula had only one way to govern, by terror, fear. He said that that's the only way to, to govern. He found uh, Wallachia in a wretched state, corruption, uh, famine, rampant crime, falling agriculture, the disappearing of trade. And he blamed for this, in this particular order, the boyars, aka nobles, the Turks, and the thieves. So that's where most of his uh, victims, as you'll see, they are from this category. The, he governed by terror, and the fear of impalement was so terrible that it was said that they left a golden cup on a fountain and nobody took it. They were completely petrified of him. Um, first, he dealt with the boyars. And this is true. This is actually in the history. You can read it in the history. So he asked them to come for a feast, right, with families around. And he asked them, you know, how many princes did you have in your lifetime? All of them, they were bragging about, oh, I had eight, I had nine, I had even 12. Oh, that's the moment to pay for it. So he decided, 
first of all, the older boyars and their families were impaled on the spot as a merciful end. Then he took the young and uh, people who could, and he marched them all the way north to River Argesh to a region where he rebuilt an old fortress. This, by the way, the fortress of, uh, where Mr. Presum presumably Mr. Elon Musk is right now, having his party over there, okay? And he right, um, rebuilt it in about a couple of months until those guys, they were almost dead or they want to be dead. Um, very few survived to the ordeal. Now, how to keep autonomy? Well, to quote the movie, I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Kind like that. Um, if the Turks thought that somehow they are going to right, control him, they were completely wrong. They call him Kazikli uh, Voivod, which means Vlad the Impaler. Why? For his favorite kind of punishment, the impalation. As a matter of fact, I even uh, brought with me uh, this one here. So in case I will need a volunteer, uh, you know, I mean, again, I mean, we can vote on that, you know, it could be member of administration or, th I'm just, anyway, okay. Okay, so, um, right, so the, he used against the Turks literally psychological pure terror. As you will see, the Turks were way too big. It's kind of a remind me with what's happening right now with Ukrainians and the Russians in a way or another, because they were like literally their armies, they were about one to 10, comparing with the size of what Vlad's army could be. He organized always small attacks. Again, remember, he lived among him for many years and he knew exactly their pressure points. Speak the language perfectly and he knew about all their legends and all their fears. And um, small attacks and ambushes against them, always during the night, always with small group, very mobile. Eventually, and if you want, you can Google that, um, he, his tactics came to military. If you go and you Google that, um, about war or on war, a German general, Clausewitz, he's mentioning his name. It's called the People's War, AKA guerrilla. Attacking, moving very fast from one part to the other, and again, they are big, you are small, but you are what? Mobile and fast. And that was his um, signature. Uh, attack. Remember, he always attack during the night. The call for the attack was ooh, the call of the wolves. That's the connection, which it was taken and put in the book by Bram Stoker. Um, his tactic was to attack around midnight, dressing his men in Turkish uniforms, hit hard and ferocious, and then retreat very fast, but not before taking as many prisoners as they could. At that time, Valachia was completely covered in forests. So as the Turks, they were in the middle of the night, still fighting because they didn't know exactly who is one, who is the other, they start hearing those terrible screams of uh, their comrades, uh, which they suffer. <laughs> Believe it or not, they were armies three or four times larger than his army who literally turned their back and they just retreat. They said, the hell with that, I'm not gonna go with, after this guy. Um, the, um, um, in the morning, they woke up to literally a forest of stakes. There were literally thousands, and I'm not joking. Again, you can check the historical truth. Forest of stakes, all of them, he literally loved the geometric patterns, and I'm not joking that. <laughs> always in a circle or in, a, in an, an angle, always on the, in the middle was the greatest leader. If it was a Turkish officer, always it was on a higher. He really respect the nobles, if you know what I mean. Um, the decaying corpses were often left up for months. And it was uh, once mentioned that a Turkish army literally turned back. They said, we're not gonna come back. And, they just, um, it was pure psychological terror and fear. 
Believe it or not, in 1462, his arch enemy, Mahomet II, the conqueror, he was not considered to be a man who, right, was afraid of. He was so disgusted of 30,000 Turks which were impaled in front of the Turk advancing Turkish army that he said, okay, just replace him with someone else and just let's get out of here. Um, now, another uh, uh, method, it was he sent people which suffer of diseases into the Turkish camps. It was a, literally like a, a, um, a germ fair, germ warfare, to let them, because again, they were big and they were spread. Also poison all the wells. That was the classic way to fight against them. Now, it's a warning. Uh, the next part, if you want to cover your ears, because I'm just gonna tell you why they were so afraid of this uh, uh, death. It was not the, the, the fact that they were dying, it was the fact how they were dying, and the fact that by the time in his last years, they reached to some parts which were really, they could keep a guy on a stake like that for three days. Again, that is, again, accordingly. So that's why I brought my, my uh, uh, two meter ruler from my physics lab. So we will need a volunteer, I'm just, anyway. So they actually impaled through the anus, and it went, probably uh, Dracula soldiers took biology with uh, our uh, uh, professors here because they could avoid every major organ from one way to the whole to the other. So they could resist for two or three days. And that was, again, that was the idea, again, scare, made them afraid, don't come back, go back, never come back. So anyway, um, Eventually, the Ottoman Turks, they were scared to such a degree that they extended that autonomy, and this is true, that's part of the history, but they replaced him, eventually, as you'll see. Now, I was asking about uh, some uh, specialist in uh, um, zoology. Um, he was exactly, again, we don't have the same uh, term, harpy eagle, are you familiar with the harpy eagle? Harpy eagle, it's a kind of an eagle, very small, which is always attacking a prey at least three or four times the size. Extremely ferocious, very cruel, exactly like that. So that's why he is called the harpy eagle. Uh, now, in, it's a different term in the Romanian language, and then, but this is pretty much, it's kind of like a small hawk, but extremely ferocious and always attacking a larger prey. Never for the small ones, always for the large ones. Um, incredible breath. Uh, cruel, ferocious to madness. Um, pretty much even his worst enemies, and you can look at the uh, uh, um, Turkish, Turk, the Turks, you should see, they mentioned his name, and they said, yes, he was uh, an infidel who needed to, to die, <laughs> but he was really courageous. And uh, on January 14, 1460, Pope Pius decided to have a a crusade against the Turks. The only leader who actually was very enthusiastic about it was uh, Vlad Dracula. And um, he actually uh, received a title, I'm gonna call it, it's in Latin, Christiane Fidi Athlete, which is champion of Christ from the Pope. He refused to pay the tribute to the Turkish uh, uh, envoys, as you'll see, it's a certain story about that. And um, he crossed the Danube into the south and literally destroy everything in his path. According with the, the historical notes, he sent bags of 23,788 severe noses as proof of his attacks. To <laughs> said, okay, look, you gave me money, but look, I, I gave you something for that. But of course, in 1462, Mohammed himself, the Right? He said, that's it, we need to deal with this guy. He crossed with 90,000 of his best army and he advanced toward the, the capital. And in June 16 is the famous night attack, which you see it in here. This is of course a painting. Uh, and he attacked with only 15,000, all of them dressed in Turkish uniforms, trying to kidnap the Sultan. They reach literally like about 40 yards, but then, the Turks, they, they, they couldn't, and they had to retreat, the same thing, taking as many prisoners, according with the history, there were about 15,000 which were impaled, 
So eventually, that's when the Sultan said, okay, just replace him and get out of here. They even called the land, it was the damned land. So it was the, 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 the name of it was the Kara Iflak, which is actually the land of the damned because they were just so afraid of, uh, of him. Um, now, he actually succeeded about three or four battles, but he ran out of money. The problem was that his supporter from the north, the Hungarian king Matthias, kind of uh, get the money from the Pope and did not send the support. So when Vlad came to, he actually retreated to the north, to this famous um, fortress. You can see here the national colors, by the way. Uh, and uh, eventually um, was uh, when Matthias, his cousin, by the way, arrest him because they said that he was, he was too cruel and anyway, and they put him in prison in Buddha. They released him in 1476 once more, but uh, again fought against the Turks, but he was killed in battle. And after he was killed, the Sultan asked for a proof that he was killed. So his head is cut, put in a jar of honey and sent to Istanbul so Mahomet II to have a last look to his arch enemy. Again, cut the head, see the connection with the stories of, um, uh, uh, right, of the vampire. Anyway, believe it or not, another thing, another interesting thing, as he was retreating to this uh, uh, castle, his wife, and this is, by the way, it's in the book, it, it, it's not in the book, it's in the movie, his wife heard that uh, he was killed in battle, so she committed suicide by jumping into the river down. Even now, right now, if you go, you will see the effluence of that river is called Ruul Duamne, which means the river of the princess. Even right now. Seems to me that she died over there. So when he came and he heard that, according with other stories, he said, I denounce, not God. Actually, he said that he denounced the Orthodox Church because the Romanians are Orthodoxes. And he just denounced and he didn't want to, to have anything with that. And then he is put in prison. And then eventually he married a Catholic princess later. But again, from in the eye of the <laughs> hardliners, uh, Orthodox priest, he was part of the devil <laughs> already because he denounced uh, his, his faith. Because, why? Because his wife was killed and they told him that, he, that she cannot receive the last rite because she committed suicide. Anyway, um, next. So let's just um, continue with famous atrocities. Again, you have two different stories, East versus West. The West, you have the German stories. Most of them, you can find them here. This is actually a real lithography from 1460 when he is dining outside and uh, these guys are just impaled. Anyway, um, you'll see that it's another story. Now, if you go to the east part, there are Polish, uh, Russian uh, stories which said that no, actually he was a kind of an okay guy. But of course, when you look at the numbers of people which were killed, uh, you can't, I mean, he was close to a psychopathic, uh, okay. So, the, this is, by the way, used by, by, uh, uh, by uh, Bram Stoker in his uh, stories. And eventually, um, right, let's be very clear, his reputation actually was tarnished by mostly this because people, they just love the sensational thing than actually the reality. As I said, the, there's a mixture between, if you read different uh, type of things, you'll see that the numbers are, yes, indeed very large, but the parts from, uh, the, the, the stories from the East, they said that they actually those guys were heathen, Turks, and they didn't count anyway. So anyway, if you try to judge him with a 21st century mind, yeah, he is a complete psych psychopath, for sure. Now, a uh, few of the stories, which I'm gonna tell you, one or two, uh, According with one of the story, which is, this is actually mentioned in a couple of uh, uh, legends, uh, the Turks, when they came, they were wearing this turban. And uh, he was, uh, he said that, you know, when you're entering to my uh, 
my, my palace, you have to take your, your turban off. The, the Turks said, you know, I'm not going to do that because we have to keep our tradition. So they said, yes, I can help you with that. So according with a lot of <laughs> uh, evidence, he asked for hammer and nail and he fixed the turban with nails in the head and sent, of course, the corpses to Istanbul so Mahomet will enjoy the, the view. So that is one of the, the, the most classic story about him. The second one, it was about a uh, noble with a keen sense of smell who was invited to dine with him near this forest of steaks, and the guy was just keeping his nose because the smell was terrible. So Dracula ordered him to be impaled, but be put on a very high stake so the smell, he will not smell the stench. Anyway, a third one is about beggars who were a lot. If you go to these uh, churches, you'll find a lot of cripples, as called cripples, begging for, for alms. And he asked them to come for an all-you-can-eat buffet and drink. And he asked them, would you like, do you want to be without cares, lacking nothing in this world? They say, hell yeah. So he closed the banquet hall and he burned it. Yeah. Last one, it's about a, another one, it's a, I call it the importance of being earnest. It's about, uh, by that time, Valachia was well known for a land where you don't have to worry about the thieves because they were so afraid of him. So one guy, he left his bag just to test it with 160 pieces of gold. So they disappeared. They found the, the thief, they impaled him, but Dracula put 161 pieces of gold. Thankfully, the guy said there is an extra piece because otherwise <laughs> you will know the result. Now, let's look, and I made for you two columns, myth and history. By the way, this is a real quote from the book. Again, I still recommend you to, to read it. Every known superstition in the world is gathered in the horseshoe of the Carpathian as it's at the center of some sort of imaginative word pool. Okay, and I'm coming back to that. Okay, so, again, remember, wolves are the children of the night, right? Myth, history, the call of the attack was always the howl of the wolf. He speaks the language of the beast. He speaks four or five languages, including Turkish. Powerful during the night, yes, most of his attacks against the Ottomans were nocturnal. Drinking the blood, that's coming from the uh, German pamphlets, a wicked blood-drinking tyrant. Remember that image where he had the feast over there? Another one, Renfield torturing the animals. There are reports uh, during his imprisonment at Buddha that he did the same. Then, stake to the heart. Stake, I don't have to explain to you, or if you want, I could, right? But I need a volunteer. Okay, and uh, then decapitation. Decapitation, remember, that's how it was his end. That was the proof sent to the Sultan that his, he died in 1476. That's when he died. It was close to the capital of Bucharest. If you ever have the chance to go over there, there is a, a, a monastery where it was his last battle. Afraid of holy symbols. Remember, he's afraid of the holy. That's because of the renunciation to the orthodoxy by marrying a Catholic prin princess. And then potentially immortal, as I said, he is the most famous Romanian prince, enduring legacy both as a hero and as a villain. Now, lastly, I got a couple of more minutes. Coming back to science. I literally, for years, I was asking myself, why all these stories? Because I'm going to be honest with you, I heard them from my grandmothers, both my grandmothers, about the undead and the haunting. Yes, I heard them. I'm going to be honest with you. Why? What's the connection with Dracula? What is, the, and again, here is a hypothesis, which is presented by few historians, by the way. So, as a matter of fact, it has nothing to do with Dracula. It has to do with corn. What? Corn? What do you mean corn? How corn can be responsible for the undead thing? Well, let me tell you the story. Corn is introduced to the southwest part of Romania, this is one of the most poor region, by the Austrians. The uh, Austrians brought it from the Spanish. Remember that the, uh, um, the Austrian emperor was also right connected with the Spanish 
if you know the history. Anyway, so they brought here the corn. It's extremely poor, but it's very fertile because here is the river Danube. It's a very fertile uh, area. They have a lot of corn, but the problem is that when the corn was brought from America, they forgot one important step. Anybody with science would know what it is? Nixtamalization. What is nixtamalization? The Mesoamericans, the uh, Native Americans, and uh, right, all of them, they know this step. You have to take the kernel of corn and put them in line. Keep them for at least two or three days. Otherwise, what will happen? Pelagra. Pelagra, it's a awful, awful disease, and it's based on diet. People which are eating only corn, that is the famous polenta, which is the most classic Romanian traditional food, but only corn, and they have no other nu nutrient, they will develop because they repeat. Corn was, it's actually, it was, right, pretty bad quality corn, and it was not treated, they will develop pellagra. Pellagra was awful from 1700s all the way to the 1950s, 1960s, there were regions, especially, as I said, in this area, there were regions exactly when Pellagra hit, that's where, in 1700s, that's when the stories about the undead come. Okay, what's the connection between Pellagra? Okay, let me tell you. Pellagra is a disease of the 3 B: Diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. The fourth D is death. I'm going to talk about the last one, dementia. By the time, by the way, you can see, right? Look at the hands, look at the face, right? That is one of the signs, clear, this is the second one, diarrhea, fern, dermatitis, and then eventually dementia. By the time they reach the dementia, I'm gonna read you the stories, watch it. It said that they actually, People which they suffer uh, this, uh, this terrible uh, disease, they starting to have um, problems of coordination. They were uh, having headaches, headaches. They start uh, attacking people surrounding them very violently, maybe biting, I don't know. And all of them, they suffer of photophobia. Anybody knows what photophobia is? Photophobia, you are afraid of light. All of them, they were afraid of light because they had terrible headaches. Now, put yourself in the place of some ignorant sharecropper, uh, peasant from 1700s in this area. What do you think it was? Would you think you will think that it's some common for scientific? No. They thought that these people are cursed, they are undead. Right? And from here, almost immediately after the corn was, by 1750, the first report, 1750, let me remind you that Dracula lived in 1460. He died in 1476. So no connection with Dracula. It's what? It's the corn. And when I say the corn, I want to be on the record. Not if you eat just the corn without the process of nixtamalization, thank you science, okay? Without any kind of other nutrients, yes, you will develop pellagra. By the way, all the south of US, go and look for that 1930s, they had this disease. You can go ahead and, and check on that. And the third D, the, the last stage, was dementia. And that kind of uh, violent attacks, it was in the eyes of ignorant peasants considered to be what? The undead. So that's exactly, indeed, they opened the graves and they put the stake into the heart. That is actually truth. I read, the, I read the news and the decapitation. And garlic, yes, I forgot, the garlic. All of them are true, but they came after Dracula, not during his lifetime. So what's at the end? Pretty much legacy. He's a villain or a hero. I let you decide. Again, I still consider 21st century, yes, he was a psychopath. <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyway, I got all the jokes. I, I really love those, um, you know, black humor jokes. That's why you'll see me here. 
bloody impaler, didn't even start impaling people until he was in mid-30s. That's why believe in yourself. And then Halloween yard decoration champion between 1456 and 1462. Anyway, there are a lot of jokes about him. And again, I'm just going to, to try. I, I don't want you to just uh, consider that I'm making a joke of it, but that's what I, it is, right? At the end of the day, I hope you don't believe in that thing. Um, the, the thing it is that actually he is considered, yes, the book is based on him. He was a real character, right? They are the connections which you've seen, which are pretty well. There are a lot of allegories in, in uh, these things. I told you about Dracula's kiss from the Victorian means S-E-X, right? And then of course, right, the real thing, it was the stories about the undead which were spreading in that area. It's actually based on the fact that they were eating poor quality corn, untreated, no other nutrients. That's how they developed Pelagra. That's again, that's a suggestion. Now, of course, based on that came a lot of stories and everything else. For the end, if you want, there are some books which I'll recommend if you guys uh, are into that. The movies I've told you about, the, probably the one which is connected both myth and history is the 1992 Bram Stoker Dracula by Ford Coppola. Uh, Gary Oldman, he speaks Romanian by the way, over there. But again, if you need any of this, and now I will let you, uh, if you have any questions. Now, again, <laughs> so just to, to end up with uh, in a high note, I hope you guys uh, enjoy my lecture and uh, you stay on the seats, uh, on, on the edge of your seats, not because you were, uh, uh, wanted to go, or, but because you were really excited. Anyway, any questions? Anybody wants to know more story? Anybody want a demonstration? I just need a volunteer. Go ahead. I am from Romania. As a matter of fact, I am Romanian by birth, American by choice. Okay. I, am, I was born in the southeast. Uh, it's on the Black Sea coast, Constanza. My wife is from Bucharest. She is the capital. Anyway, so anybody else? Any other questions? Anything would you like to know? Oh my God. <laughs> oh yes, the, the, the Halloween, and by the way, just to show you that I'm not joking, um, I've got the um, story here. Um, right, here it is. Elon Musk is hosting a Halloween private party at the Brand Castle, you've seen it, right, on uh, 31st of, right now, that's probably, it's over there, it's about 7.30 p.m., so that's probably they started. This Angelina Jolie. Again, these are, again, I didn't really check, but that's what it was reported. Probably is not true, but we don't know yet. Anyway, that, that is a big destination. Incredibly expensive to find a parking lot place here. Not forget about the, the you know, to really rent it. Uh, that was actually part of the royal family. They give it to the, to, to back to the people, and now they are actually renting for that. They, they get a pretty decent amount of money, considering. Uh, Yes and no, yes. I mean, most of them, they are excited because they sell. I mean, you have no idea how they, it sells. It sells like crazy. I, I was touring when I was in my student years. Uh, American, British, Swedish, anybody speak uh, some form of English language. They went over there and they, all of them, they went to go here. Now, uh, historians are not so crazy about because they, it's kind of a, a mixture, but Let's be very honest, the economy in the area, whoa. You will find about 100 Dracula's uh, places around and uh, from wine to plum brandy to steaks to garlic to whatever you want, it's, it's over there. Yeah, so it's plenty, yeah. Now, it's a commercialization and nationalism, you know. Some guys, they said, oh, no, 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 don't say that, it's not true. The other guy said, you know, let's go. They want it, okay, we're gonna give it to them. If you go to London, you will see about a thousand Japanese taking picture of Baker Street. Anybody knows what Baker Street is? It was the Sherlock Holmes, which is clearly a made up. And they are just taking 1,000 pictures over there, <laughs> which is just people. Yes, that's what it is. So thank you, Bram Stoker. Right? 
I can be, because I'm kind of in a way responsible, Bram Stoker is responsible for my coming here because there were tourists who came to Romania, I was invited, and so on and so on. Anybody else, any other questions? If not, thank you very much for your time, and I hope I'll see you in uh, another one. Thank you very much. Thank you.